the first verse. Don't judge so that you won't be judged. You'll receive the same judgment you give. Whatever you deal out will be dealt out to you. Why do you see the splinter that's in your brother's or sister's eye, but don't notice the log in your own eye? How can you say to your brother or your sister, let me take the splinter out of your eye when there's a log in your own eye? You deceive yourself. First take the log out of your eye, and then you'll see clearly to take the splinter out of your brother's and sister's eye. From the Gospel of Luke, the 18th chapter, beginning with the 10th verse. Two people went up to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed about himself with these words. God, I thank you that I'm not like in everyone else, crooks, <laughs> evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of everything I receive. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He wouldn't even lift his eyes to look toward heaven. Rather, he struck his chest and said, God, show mercy to me, a sinner. I tell you, this person went down to his home justified rather than the Pharisee. All who lift themselves up will be brought low, and those who make themselves low will be lifted up. This is the word of the Lord. The Lord's name be praised. Today we come to the final topic of our sermon series on half-truths, a discussion of the sayings and beliefs that people of faith often think can be found in the Bible, but in truth are not scripturally sound. Let's recap for a moment what we have been discussing over the past five weeks. In part one, we looked at the half-truth everything happens for a reason. And what we discovered was that this saying doesn't tell us the whole truth about how God works in the world or works in our own lives. In part two, we discovered that the saying, God helps those who help themselves, flies in the face of grace because the whole truth is that God helps those who cannot help themselves. To quote Adam Hamilton, the author of our series. In part three, God won't give you more than you can handle, we decided that a better phrase to use is, God will help you handle whatever comes your way in this life. And then last week in part four, God said it, I believe it, that settles it. We learned that scripture is a lot more complicated than we think and requires a good examination of the context, the culture, the purpose, and the inspiration found within the passages we are reading. This week, we are focusing on the quote, love the sinner, hate the sin. I don't know about you, but whenever someone shares this quote with me, for me, it almost feels rather like a backhanded compliment. Have you ever heard someone give you a backhanded compliment? It starts out nicely enough, and it's obvious that the person is well-meaning, but then the compliment takes a turn, sometimes for the worse. You are such a beautiful couple together. And when I'm as old as you, <laughs> I hope. 
Occasionally, someone will say something like that to me after worship. Oh, pastor, I really liked your sermon today. It was so good, but... <laughs> and what comes after the but completely negates what came before it. It's a little passive aggressive, my therapist friends tell me, and I've got some good friends who are licensed therapists, and they always say, watch out for the butts. <laughs> I tend to agree with them. Love the sinner, hate the sin, is not in the Bible. Although many people think that it is part of scripture. Jesus never said anything like this. The statement doesn't even come close to what he did say about sin, but we'll get to that in just a moment. Love the sinner, hate the sin, does seem to have been co-opted from something that St. Augustine once wrote. In case you aren't all that familiar with saints of the early Christian church, St. Augustine was a bishop in North Africa who lived sometime in the late 4th to early 5th centuries. It's said that in his capacity as a church leader, St. Augustine was writing to a group of nuns and encouraging them to remain chaste. In the latter, he called for them to have a love for mankind and a hatred of sins. Little did he know that several centuries later, we Christians would come along and we would co-opt his words so that we might use them to express our dislike of someone else's sin. Another source of this half-truth seems to have been Mahatma Gandhi. He said something just like it in his autobiography that was published in 1929. Only his quote had a caveat. Gandhi wrote, hate the sin and not the sinner is a precept which, though easy enough to understand, is rarely practiced. And that is why the poison of hatred spreads in the world. That's the full quote. But most people never read that far. The full meaning of what he was saying was this, that it's hard to separate the hating of sin and the loving of the sinner. More often than not, in hating someone else's sin, we often end up actually doing harm to the sinner. Love the sinner, hate the sin. Well, maybe we need to look at the concept of sin itself in the Bible. And there are lots of words in the Bible that we translate into our English word, sin. The Hebrew word chata and the Greek word hamatira are both used for the English word sin. But you and I know that sometimes the fuller, richer meaning of a word or a phrase can get lost in translation. In this case, chata or hamatia are more accurately translated to mean missing the mark or straying from the path. The path or the mark, of course, referring to God's intentions for us as we live our lives. Sin is basically any time that we miss the mark of what God has in mind for us to consider or to do or to act upon. It's any time, any situation or circumstance where we veer away from or behave or do something contrary to what God would intend for us. The truth is, we all sin. And we sin every day. We are not perfect creatures. And every day, we face struggles and challenges with what in this life is the right thing to do or the wrong thing to do. St. Paul wrote in his letter to the Romans, all have sinned and fall short of God's glory. But St. Paul's words lead us to an important question. Is all sin equal? Common sense, of course, tells us no. Listen to what Adam Hamilton writes. Eating a dozen Krispy Kreme donuts in one sitting is an act of gluttony, and gluttony is not God's will. It's not healthy, and it can cut our life short. But is eating a dozen donuts in one sitting equal 
in God's eyes, to driving while intoxicated with the potential of killing another human being. Both are sins. Both start with over-consuming. But the potential consequences are very, very different. I suppose that some people could argue that all sin is equal in the eyes of God by quoting from Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus talks about murder being the same as being angry with someone, or where he says that just thinking about committing adultery is the same as committing the act in real time. It does seem like he's saying that all sin is equal on this occasion until we remember that in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is engaging in what we call prophetic hyperbole. In other words, he exaggerates to make a point. No, not all sin is equal. Our Roman Catholic brothers and sisters put forth in their theology the concept of mortal sins and venial sins. Venial sins are less serious and can be readily forgiven. Mortal sins are a more severe violation of God's intentions for us. The Roman Church even has a list of seven deadly sins, and maybe you've heard of them. From less serious to most serious, they are lust, gluttony, greed, sloth, wrath, envy, and pride. The Roman Church says that pride is the most dangerous and deadliest sin of all because from pride all other sins arise. The half-truth of love the sinner, hate the sin is that it is based in the idea that all sin is equal, which is neither scriptural nor is it theological. And more importantly, it's not compatible with the teachings of Jesus. Now, of course, Jesus loves sinners. Zacchaeus, the woman at the well, the rich young ruler who wanted to know about inheriting eternal life, to name just a few. The stories we tell about Jesus are always about sinners and grace and redemption. But here's the problem. And again, I'm quoting from Adam Hamilton. Though Jesus certainly loves sinners, he never actually said, love the sinner. What he did say, and it's an important distinction, is love your neighbor. As Jesus' teaching made clear, your neighbor is everyone you meet, even those you haven't met. It means doing good to them, seeking to bless and encourage them. It means showing kindness to them, though they have no right to claim this from us. Jesus goes even further in explaining who our neighbors are. He expressly commands us to love our enemies, people who have wronged us, people who might not do unto us as they wish others would do to them. We are to seek good for our enemies because when we do, the world changes. Jesus tells us not to return evil for evil, take an eye for an eye, as Gandhi is said to have observed, an eye for an eye makes the whole world blind. So if we are called to love our neighbors and love our enemies, why doesn't Jesus ever say, love the sinner? It probably has to do with that last and deadliest of sins, pride. In the story of the tax collector and the Pharisee, Jesus was very quick to tell us about our human tendency to want to judge others and focus on their sin, rather than our own. Pharisees were the religious leaders who believed that they needed to keep themselves set apart, pure from sinners, which was basically everyone else with whom they came into contact. So this way, by being set apart, they would remain holy before God. Tax collectors in Jesus' day were the worst of the worst. 
they collaborated with the Roman occupying forces and cheated the people. But in this story, it is the tax collector who humbles himself before God, seeking forgiveness for his sinfulness. And it is the Pharisee who is unable, as we read in the Gospel of Matthew, to see the log in his own eye. Love the sinner, hate the sin. Though it sounds right, invites us down the path of pride every time, before we even know it. It allows us to puff ourselves up and think in self-righteous ways. Well, you're a sinner, so I'm, I'm going to graciously choose to love you. It allows us to put ourselves in the position of the Pharisee, seeing everyone else as a sinner and not as our neighbor, which is exactly what Jesus didn't want us to do seeing someone as a sinner rather than as our neighbor is very different from what jesus had in mind have you ever met someone like like that pharisee someone who is convinced they are so righteous in their living and their thinking that they look down upon the rest of us with disgust. Here's an awful thought. What if that person is us? It happens, you know. Jesus knows, too, that it happens, even with the best of us. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, your strength, and your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor, he said, because deep down, deep down he knew that we're all just sinners in need of redemption and grace. It's interesting that in the scriptures, when Jesus was spending time with drunkards and prostitutes and thieves and cheaters and adulterers, we never hear him say, I love you, but I hate your sin. Instead, when he talks with sinful people, he always talks about forgiveness. There are so many stories like that in the Bible. The only time that Jesus ever demonstrates a hatred of someone's sin is when he is speaking to the religious leaders, the Pharisees. He calls them hypocrites. He says that they are like whitewashed tombs, beautiful on the outside, but full of dead bones and filth on the inside. What's sad about all of this is that there are some people who see the church that way today. People who won't cross our threshold because they've experienced us at our worst when we've criticized or condemned other people, when we've puffed ourselves up with pride and we've stepped into the role of Pharisee rather than taking the log out of our own eye. In his book, Adam Hamilton tells the story of receiving a cartoon from someone in his church. It's a picture of St. Peter at the pearly gates. A person who has just died is standing before him, hoping to get into heaven. As St. Peter finds the appropriate page in the book of life, he says, I see you were a believer, but you skipped the not being a jerk about it part. <laughs> I don't know about you, but these days, it's a real struggle to be a Christian. 
Love the sinner, hate the sin. Is that the best that we can do? Tell each other half-truths? All because loving our neighbor is, is too hard? Loving people we, we don't understand? Loving people who make us afraid? Or who offend our sensibilities? Or have different ideas from us? We're just people for the sake of Christ, aren't we? Here's another question to ponder. Does our human tendency toward pride mean that we don't speak out at all about sin? Of course not. There is sin in this world, and it should be decried. It presents in the form of, of child abuse and spousal abuse, in the form of racism and sexism and economic injustice, in the form of children dying of starvation in a world of plenty. It presents in the form of human trafficking and greed and the need for health care and clean air and clean water and gun violence. As Christians, it is appropriate for us to speak out about sin, about systemic evil, when we encounter it, and to work for fair and equitable change in the world for the good of all God's people. But we don't have to be jerks about it. We are all in this great big world together, and more than anything, that is what Jesus invites us to remember. I think that's why he was so emphatic about saying, love God and love your neighbor rather than love the sin and hate the sinner. He knew that it would serve as a countermeasure to our prideful ways. And he knew that it would keep us on the path of righteousness and truth rather than veering off into half-truths and platitudes that only serve our selfish interests or beliefs. If you have been reading any of the articles from the online United Methodist News Service, and I really encourage you to do that, you are aware that there is much conversation and debate across our denomination regarding the language in our Book of Discipline that speaks to human sexuality. We are struggling right now as a denomination with scripture, with the tradition of the church, with what our reason tells us, and with the myriad of life experiences that tug at our hearts and our minds and our souls as the people of the United Methodist Church. There are some in our church who are speaking of schism, a division, a splitting in the church once more along theological, and sadly enough, in some cases, ideological lines. That's nothing new. Our whole history as a denomination has been fraught with schism. But with the help of the Holy Spirit, we have always found our way back to one another. We have always found a way to come home to one another. What's different this time is that the conversation is about a subject that is deeply intimate and deeply per personal and at the core center of our creation as human beings. It's going to be a difficult conversation, but it is a conversation that is needed. Other denominations have already had this conversation. We are one of the last mainline denominations to engage it. The Lutherans, the Episcopalians, the Presbyterians, the United Church of Christ, the Disciples of Christ, even Reform and Conservative Jews have already had a conversation concerning human sexuality and the inclusion of the lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgendered community 
in the full life of their houses of worship. As our church moves into the discussion, my prayer is that we will treat one another gently and that we will ensure that we do not do any permanent damage to one another. I am praying after all is said and done and after all the discussion and all the rhetoric and all the things we say to one another, some truthful, some half truthful, that the Holy Spirit will lead us back to one another. I am praying for a homecoming, one where we affirm the commands of Jesus to love God and to love each other. I'm going to let Adam Hamilton have the last word today as we finish up this series. Yes, there is sin in the world. When that sin is inflicted upon others, when it's bringing harm to them, we must, in the words of the Proverbs, speak out on behalf of the voiceless and for the rights of all who are vulnerable. We're to be painfully aware of our own sin and regularly invite God to transform us and heal us and forgive us. We're also to recognize that we may not see clearly how God sees, nor understand fully how God understands. What we can see clearly and what is unmistakable regarding God's will is that we love. The truth in love the sinner, hate the sin stops with the first word, love. So let's love one another and strive to lay aside our own sin while demonstrating humility and grace toward others. To that I would say, amen.